So our next talk uh, is by Alison. Alison's role is a strategist, trainer and workshop facilitator to help teams in the creative and digital sectors to work better together. Get ready for some practical tips for designing and facilitating workshops that generate concrete outcomes. Please welcome Alison to the stage. Hello. What makes a great workshop? So I want you to think back to the last time you were part of a fantastic workshop. Not one that you were facilitating, but as a participant. And what made it so great? So just have a quick think. So it may be because of the content you created, or you had some breakthrough ideas, and you got some clarity with your team. But at the same time, it's probably likely down to the fact that you had a good experience and how that workshop made you feel. You may have felt engaged, um, connected, um, you may have felt more connected to your team, and you may have felt heard as well, being able to contribute your ideas. So I want you to keep that feeling in your head throughout this talk, because for me, that feeling is key to developing a great team culture. There's no reason why those experiences and those feelings need to be confined to a workshop itself. So that's what I think. I think workshops can be more than a one-off event. You know, they can be great in themselves. You can have a fantastic day. But there's so much more in the potential of workshops to contribute to the way that we work together. So I'm going to be talking to you about how you create workshops of impact and some really practical tips for making your workshops better. And then talking to you about how workshops can contribute to a better team culture. Now, the reason I come from this angle is that when I started out, I didn't really start out to be a workshop facilitator. I didn't really start out thinking that I wanted to facilitate workshops. I was really passionate about collaboration. Um, for me, I wanted to bring um, people with different skills and expertise together into teams and help them work brilliantly together to create great things. And because I was bringing people together that perhaps had never met before, um, people across different disciplines, whenever we kicked off a project, it made sense to me to get everyone in the room and discuss how we would work together and what we would do together and how we would make great work for a client. And because I wasn't the creative producer, I was the one that would plan exactly how we would um, deliver that discussion or how we would progress through that discussion and make sure we kept on track at the da on the day. And I didn't realise at the time that what I was doing was workshop facilitation, but as I said, it just made sense to me. It was more about the fact that this format of bringing people together was a tool in supporting the way that the team worked together, a tool in supporting creative collaboration. And it just turned out that I also ended up loving the process of workshop facilitation as well. So creating workshops with impact, how do you, how do you make sure that the event itself is purposeful, but also leads to something bigger in an outcome? For me, it's about the workshop design. So a workshop is a three-step process. We may think specifically about the day, and we may think a little bit about the preparation, but it's a three-step process. And the workshop design is my craft. I love it. It's my creative outlet. It's where I get into my flow, thinking about the processes that we're going to um, go through together, the discussions that we're going to have, how we're going to get that team on track and aligned. But it's a three-step process. You've got the design, the preparation, you have the facilitation on the day, and then you also have the follow-up, what happens after the workshop. And the follow-up is the, 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 the part of this three-stage process that we often forget about, or we kind of leave to chance. We don't think about intentionally how we're going to make sure that the results from a, from a workshop have a really great impact afterwards. And for me, the, the key to making a workshop with impact is to actually think about the follow-up when you're doing the design. Think about what it is that you want to achieve from the workshop. What needs to happen afterwards? What is this workshop contributing to? And bake that into your design right from the start. So these are the results that you might get from a great workshop. Collaboration, creativity, equal contributions, great content, clarity, momentum. Those are all the kind of very tangible, specific results that we want to get. And in order to do that, we also need to think about the purpose. So when you think about it, going back to my original journey into workshops and to running these collaborative sessions, a, a session in itself is always part of a bigger project. 
it's a means to an end rather than the end in, end in itself. So when you think about that, you think about the context that a workshop sits within, you understand that there's part of a bigger picture there. And you understand that this workshop is not a standalone event. Actually, there's, there's other things that you need to think about in order to make that workshop work. So thinking about the purpose, thinking about what is the bigger picture, what is it that we're trying to achieve, is really key in making that workshop impactful. And purpose is important to us in the work that we do, you know, as creative individuals, as people that work in the knowledge economy. Uh, it's one of Dan Pink's three principles for motivating people like us. The other two, autonomy and mastery, which I'll talk a bit a bit about a bit later. But he describes purpose as this, you know, the deep motivation and engagement that people have when they feel they are working towards something much bigger than themselves. Again, remembering that a workshop is not the event in itself, actually it's contributing to something much bigger. And the key to creating a workshop with impact is to think about that bigger picture and to bake it into your workshop design. And then you need to think about what happens after the workshop. So as I said, you know, the follow-up is something that we often leave to chance, but it's actually key in creating an impactful workshop, a workshop that matters. What is it that you need this workshop to do? What project is it contributing towards? How is it going to help the project progress? How is it going to help your team stay aligned and motivated? And once you have that outcome, then as I say, you bring it straight back into your workshop design and you bake it in from the start. So you might have your purpose. You've identified your purpose at the beginning of the workshop. Um, and then you've identified your outcome. And in your workshop design, your task is to fill in the missing middle. And this is where you think about your workshop activities, but not yet. You know, you're kind of designing the purpose. And you fill in the missing middle to start off with, with questions. So if you're designing a workshop or you're facilitating a workshop, I always say that questions are the main communication tool of a workshop facilitator. Because as a workshop facilitator, you're not there to provide the answers. You're there to gather the answers from all of the participants in the room. So you're going to be asking questions before your workshop as you're planning it. What is it that I want to find out from the participants in the room? What are all the unknowns we need to explore? What are the problems that we need to uncover? And then you're going to be asking questions in the actual workshop when you're trying to draw out that content from participants as well. And once you've got your questions, then you start thinking about the journey and the experience that you want to create for your participants. So going back to the question that I asked you at the beginning, you know, when, what made the workshop great that you were thinking about was the experience that you had. So what's the natural flow that you want to take your participants through so that they can get that experience too? They can feel engaged, connected. So these are some of the things that you might want to achieve from a great workshop in terms of the experience for a participant. You know, the engagement, the connection as we spoke about. The Dan Pink's three principles for motivating creative people, autonomy. We get to an outcome in the way that works best for us. Mastery, we're challenged in a way that engages us and enables us to develop, but not too, not too much, not too hard, and also not too, too simple, just at the right level to match our, our skills. Um, purpose, as we've spoken about, knowing that the work that we're doing contributes to a bigger picture. And also making progress, having that feeling that we're moving forward. In fact, if you've, um, I'm not sure if any, any of you have read the book by Teresa Mabile, who's one of my favourite scholars on team creativity, and she wrote a book with her husband, Stephen Kramer, called The Progress Principle. And she um, studied 238 knowledge workers and asked them to write a diary entry at the end of the day ended up with 11,000 diary entries, and she scaled through all of these diary entries to understand what was it that made their days great. And the single most, most common factor in all of these diary entries was that every person had made a bit of progress moving forward. It didn't have to be massive, just a small amount of progress moving forward. So how can we, again, in our workshops, encourage that progress, and how can we continue that after the workshop to contribute to our team culture? So some practical workshop tips. I promised you some practical workshop tips. First one, have a facilitator. Now, that sounds so basic, but I've been having a lot of conversations with people recently about the, the situations they find themselves in when they're both invested in the outcome of a project, but also facilitating the workshop as well. And I know that can't be avoided in some situations, but it's not ideal for a range of reasons. The first one is that the role of a facilitator is meant to be objective. You're meant to be able to take a step back and 
take an overview of the, what's happening in the room and keeping an eye on the discussions and keeping an eye on time. You're not meant to contribute to the content. You're there to draw the answers out from the participants. And secondly, a facilitator is there to keep an eye on group dynamics. You know, the, as you mentioned, as you, as you thought about your experience of a great workshop, it was all about being engaged and being heard and being able to contribute your ideas. There's so many reasons why when groups get together, those things don't happen naturally. And a facilitator is a key role in making sure that those equal contributions happen. So even though it's a really, really basic tip, this, this idea of if you're facilitating a workshop, not participating at the same time is really key. Second tip, have time for individual thinking. So we may think that in a workshop it's all about group discussions and all about collaborating intensively. Whereas actually we also need pockets of time when people are able to do their own individual thinking and work. Now again, there's so many reasons in a workshop why there may not be equal contributions or some people may speak up more than others. It may be the difference between introverts and extroverts. Introverts get their energy from being alone, so they like to think before they speak. Extroverts get their energy from being around people, so they speak in order to gather their thoughts and to develop their thoughts. And the way that plays out in workshops is that the extroverts are talking a lot. And the introverts perhaps don't have time to develop the thoughts that they want to talk about or they want to contribute. So how do you kind of balance that out? One way is to make sure that everybody has a little bit of time to think about responses, the questions that you're answering, asking, before they discuss in a group. This also works for other situations, junior staff, more senior staff, um, and the challenges that might exist between junior staff speaking up in front of more senior people. But having that time for individual thinking can really make a difference in the way that people feel in contributing to a workshop. This is another really simple tip that can make a massive difference. Separating out divergent thinking and convergent thinking. So divergent thinking is all about generating lots of ideas, thinking about possibilities, opportunities, you're going for quantity. Convergent thinking is when you want to select a few of those ideas. You need to apply criteria to, to whittle it down to a few. Now those two types of thinking will interfere with each other. Because if you have people trying to converge on ideas before you've had the opportunity to open out, then you're going to shut down ideas too early. If you have people um, in convergent thinking stage and you've got people still trying to come up with more ideas, then you're going to go around in a discussion loop and it's going to get very, very frustrating for people in the room. So separating out those two types of thinking in the activities that you do and in the discussions you do can make a big difference in contributing to a productive discussion. <coughs> Similar to that, you want to make space for productive conflict. So one of the things that you, you want to run workshops for, when you're running workshops, you want to avoid this idea of groupthink. People thinking in the same way or avoiding challenging ideas just for the sake of keeping the peace. That's the enemy of creativity and not the reason why we're working together in teams. The reason we work together in teams is because we want to make the use of everyone's skills and expertise, especially in a multidisciplinary team. So you want to make space for that, creative, that productive conflict. What, what situations can you create after having generated lots of ideas, moving into a space where it's like, okay, now is the time to critique these ideas. Let's challenge these ideas. Let's not get defensive about them. We want to make them better. How can we make these ideas better? Really great example of that is Pixar Brain Trusts. So Pixar have a specific meeting whereby the producer of an animation brings along the script and the work they've done so far, and everyone's sitting around the table. Their role is specifically to pick holes in that script and to provide constructive criticism to that producer. And it's up to the producer whether they take it or not, but the, the key thing is, is that space has been created specifically for that productive conflict. And make it dynamic. You know, there's, again, the, the, we, we, we associate workshops with post-it notes and Sharpies, and there's a reason for it. Because, you know, we can write things on um, post-it notes, we can move them around, um, we can shape our ideas, we can stand up, we can stick things on the wall. We want to make things with our hands. And there's research that shows that when you engage people with their hands, when you get them standing up in meetings, they're more productive. So how can you make your, your workshops more engaging, more dynamic, more active? 
So those are my five tips for effective workshops. You know, have a facilitator, make time for individual thinking, separate out divergent and convergent thinking, and create space for productive conflict, and make it dynamic. And they're great tips for effective workshops, but I also think they're great tips for meetings as well. The thing is with our meetings is that they're broken. You know, we all have too many of them, they're unproductive, they last too long, some people don't get the opportunity to speak. And I really feel that meetings don't fit the purpose for the types of teams that we need to work in today, the types of organisations that we need and the, type, the kind of work that we need to do. We work in multidisciplinary teams, we work in te we, we're working much more quickly, the work that we do is more dynamic, we're working as, multi as part of multiple teams, we're working across geographical locations and the meetings that we have, the typical meetings that we have, don't fit that purpose. So when I say a typical meeting, this is the kind of thing that I'm describing. You know, known facts or decisions to be communicated. That's okay if you know the answers. The power dynamic of the loudest or most senior person in the room. That's okay if the loudest person or the most senior, per senior person in the room always has the best ideas. And passive attendees. That's okay if you don't want to hear anything from the rest of your team members. On the other hand, great workshops. You're there to explore lots of different possibilities and options, especially when the answers are unknown. Equal contributions. You know, the facilitator is there to make sure that you hear something from everybody in the room. So equal contributions, regardless of role. The best ideas can come from anywhere. And dynamic. You know, people are engaged, they're getting involved, people are walking around, they're sticking things on walls, they're actively participating in this workshop. So there's three things that I want to share with you in ways that you can start to um, change your meetings to be more like workshops and use principles from workshops to contribute to a better team culture and your team working together. And the first one is bringing workshop style activities to meetings. There's no reason why we have to run full workshops all the time. We can take activities, little five minute tasks, and use them to jazz up our meetings. So one example is um, a check-in. Check-in is a really great tool at the beginning of your meeting, rather than launching straight into a discussion about your t your, your, the work that you need to do. Um, you can ask everyone around the table a question, a question that's personal to them. How did you get to work this morning? How was your journey into work? How was your weekend? What's the thing that's most exciting you about this week? And take it in turns to go around. And that instantly opens up the environment and creates a, a safer space for people to contribute their ideas. The other thing that I've seen that is really, really powerful is giving people a stack of post-it notes and a Sharpie, putting a stack of post-it notes and a Sharpie at everybody's place. I've seen how people's faces light up when they walk into a room, when they can see that they're sitting in a space where their ideas are specifically meant to be captured and heard. So just that power of a post-it note, giving people a stack of post-it notes and saying, I want to hear from you, I want you to write down your ideas and share them, can make a massive difference. Second tip is to take a design approach to your meetings. So often when we're calling a meeting, we just put a time in the calendar, we book a room, and we all bundle into the room and then decide what we're going to talk about. Whereas, as I mentioned with a workshop, the, 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 work, the process of workshop design is a, is a craft, it's my craft. You're thinking about how you're going to get the best of everyone in the room, how you're going to progress everyone through a discussion in the context of the larger project. What is it that you need to discuss? What is it that you need to do? So you wanted to, for every meeting that you have, you might want to look at all of the meetings across um, your, your team, all the meetings that you have regularly, and really define the purpose, because not every meeting is equal. Every meeting has a very different purpose. It may be that you need a very quick status update meeting. It may be that you need to have a longer brainstorming session. They're all different. And when you've defined that purpose, then you'll choose the right format for it, and you'll design it accordingly. And then what happens when you start to define your meetings differently in this way, you'll, you'll see that there may be a bit of a rhythm to the way that your team works because there'll be regular meetings that come up time and time again um, based on what it is that you need to do. And the, these meetings can start to form the heartbeat of your team, keeping you in contact with each other and keeping you checking in and coming back and aligned on the same page. So how can you make your meetings more like workshops? What can you take from the principles of workshops to make your meetings more engaging, more dynamic, and make sure that everybody's heard? 
Another tip is to rotate the role of the facilitator. So the, the facilitator has got a very specific purpose, a very specific role in making sure that everyone has equal contributions across the, in, the, in the workshop, in the session. Um, and also making sure that they keep an eye on the dynamics and keep an eye on time. So I mentioned you can't do both of those at the same time. It's very, very difficult to facilitate and participate at the same time. But a workshop facilitator has very key skills that are very useful for a team or team members or individuals in developing and creating interactions with other people. So these are some of the key skills that I think are useful for a workshop facilitator. First one, being curious and asking great questions. I mentioned this at the beginning. Questions, the main communication tool of the facilitator. A facilitator is genuinely curious in what the participants have to say. They don't have any of the answers. They're there to find out the answers. So asking those good questions is a really, really good skill to develop. And if you ask really good questions, then you're going to get answers back. And the key skill of a facilitator in this sense is actively listening, really listening to what people have to say listening to what they say, reflecting it back to them, but also listening to what they don't say and reading the, the mood in the room and kind of trying to piece together the, the things that aren't being said. And if you've done a good job in making sure that people feel safe in speaking up and contributing their ideas, then you're going to get a lot of answers and probably conflicting answers and conflicting responses. So one of the key skills of a workshop facilitator is to be able to deal with uncertainty, being able to deal with that mess that comes with um, encouraging ideas and encouraging creativity from people. And this always, always happens in workshops. There'll always be a point when it feels really messy and it feels like there's lots and lots of ideas. That's a natural part of creativity. So developing the skill to be able to deal with that creativity is something that's useful not just in workshops, but generally in the way that we work together. And then finally, gathering all of that information and synthesizing that, that content together. The, the, as a facilitator, as being objective, you're able to perhaps spot the connections that the participants can't because they're so involved in the discussion. So a key skill is being able to step back and see what's going on, to connect the dots and reflect it back to the participants. So these are all great skills for facilitation, all great skills for, for workshops, but also great skills in the, the relationships that we build and the relationships that we build with our team, and key skills for leading and managing messy, creative projects as well. I love this phrase. It was um, someone on, on LinkedIn, Dennis O'Brien, a colleague of mine, someone that I met ages ago, tagged me in one of his comments on another post. And he was talking about employee engagement. And he said, Alison, this is connected to the work that you do. Um, these, when people feel engaged and they feel happy at work, these are the unintended consequences of your workshops. And I love this, and I've stolen it, and I'm using it all the time, because um, I think it's such a great phrase. You know, so we've spoken about the results that you might get from a workshop, the real tangible hard results that you might get from workshop, collaboration, creativity, etc. Spoken about the experience. But when people are able to work together collaboratively in a session like that, and when they're able to have their ideas heard, these are the unintended consequences of workshops. People feel heard. Think about how that changes the way that you work together. You have better communication. Because you've been practicing this communication in the team, you value each other's ideas, you value, value each other's differences, there's more transparency. You start to trust each other more. You start to trust in and believe in the, the, the capabilities of people. Um, but as you open up, um, you're able to depend on your teammates more as well. And it starts to open up avenues for new ways of working. These discussions, this openness, starts to help you think about how you can work better together as a team. What can we do to improve this communication? What can we do to make sure we stay on track? So great workshops, great teams. I like to call this workshop culture. So the way that I've seen you know, workshops much more than a one-off event. Workshops can be great as an event in themselves. But when people feel the, the power of a workshop in the fact that they've you know, encouraged that collaboration, they've encouraged those, encouraged those contributions, they might be tempted to run more workshops or start to turn some of their meetings into more workshop-style events. And the impact of meeting like this more frequently has an impact on the team culture. And that's what I like to call a workshop culture, where we start to see the principles of workshops 
spread out into the way that our team works together generally. All of that great experience that you thought about when you thought about a fantastic workshop isn't just confined to a one hour, two hour, three hour day event. It's actually something that we experience with our teams generally. So on that note, how can you improve your team culture with workshops? Thank you. Right, there's some Q&A, if that's okay. Yeah. So one of the questions that was asked, um, how do you approach workshops with team members that may not want to participate and already have ne negative preset opinions? Mm. So this can, this can happen for a couple of reasons, I think. And one of the reasons that I see this happening is when uh, people have lost faith in the workshop format, and the reason often that they lose faith in the workshop format is because of that thing that I mentioned at the beginning, the lack of the follow-up. So you can come along, have a great time, and you know, spend half a day in a workshop um, generating lots of ideas, and then two weeks later, everyone's kind of thinking, well, what happened to all of those post-it notes? Where did they go? Right, so that's one thing, sort of making sure that the workshop itself is really going to have that impact. The other thing is um, treating those people with empathy. When somebody's being difficult or when somebody's kind of, you know, resisting something, there's, there's usually a reason why they're resisting. Um, and again, one of the key skills of a facilitator is that empathy, understanding why somebody may be difficult rather than just labelling them as difficult. So maybe you'll be curious about why, finding out why it is that they're resisting this change or resisting this, this format and speak to them. Have a chat with them. Yeah. Uh, another question. Since designers sometimes and often have a stake in the game, mm. technically should we be facilitating workshops? So that's one of my kind of rules and principles of facilitation is like, just don't facilitate and participate at the same time. I would say that it's very, very challenging to do because of all the reasons I mentioned. Um, I would avoid it if you can because it's, one, it's difficult for you because of all the work that you need to do. Um, keep an eye on the group dynamics, like keep an eye on time, making sure that everyone's contributing. But it's also really confusing for your participants as well because, you know, as a facilitator, they see you as objective. But then if you're um, critiquing their ideas and contributing your ideas, then are you a facilitator? Are you a participant? It's really a good idea to try and keep those two roles separate if you can. Uh, next question from Chris. What's the most common or important mistake you see inexperienced or ineffective workshop facilities as Sorry, make? Can I say that? Sorry, it's, it's what's the most common or important mistake you see mm. inexperienced workshop facility as make? Inexperienced. Um, well, I don't really like to use that word. I think that everyone's got. I think everyone has got facilitation skills mm. in them. I just think it's about conf growing confidence. Yeah. So maybe um, one of the things that I would say with new facilitators is probably trying to do too much at the same time. Um, it may be that you've seen someone facilitate a great workshop and you're trying to emulate all of the things that they did, reading the room and keeping the room engaged and um, taking notes, and it's just really daunting and really overwhelming. So I'd say that if you're a new facilitator, focus on the things that are most visible to your participants. Focus on um, things like note-taking, because they're going to notice um, the content they came up with. Um, focus on timekeeping, because they're going to notice whether the workshop runs over time. And focus on making it collaborative. So spend a lot of time on the design, trying to think about ways that you're going to overcome some of those group dynamics that teams can often fall into, such as introverts versus extroverts and groupthink. Spend all of your time creating exercises as much as you can around circumventing some of those situations and just focus on that. I do believe that it's really possible to facilitate a relatively good workshop without having very much presence on the day by focusing on those kinds of things. Okay. Bit of a personal one for you, actually. Mm. Um, uh -oh. <laughs> what was the trigger that made you think, yeah, I actually want to be a workshop facilitator? People telling me that they wanted to pay me for it. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly, I honestly, I, to be honest, I really didn't know that people would, you know, it's just something that was so natural to me because I loved collaboration. Yeah. I really didn't know that it was something that people would pay for. And it just so happened that people were saying to me, can you come and do that for my team? And that's literally how the switch, switch happened. That's a brilliant answer. <laughs> um, somebody's asked, I'm interested to learn how you validate what a good question is. 
um, well, what do you think is a good question? <laughs> and the next question is... <laughs> <laughs> what is the best way to convince people about workshops who feel they don't work well due to preconceived ideas that they involve silly games, etc., and if effectively refuse to take part of it? That type of person that may just sit at the back of the room yeah. and then work, like walk out after five minutes. Do it in secret, I would say. I would say um, don't try to uh, run a full workshop or a sort of a full day workshop. Take a work, let's say, take a workshop style activity into a meeting. Just take five minutes out of a, a meeting and do what I call um, maybe a brain dump, which is where you just ask a question, get people to write down um, their responses, one idea per post to note, and sort those ideas. And that's such a quick thing that it's non offensive, it doesn't take up a lot of time, but it can be very, very effective in getting people to kind of clarify thoughts. So I'd say kind of take it slowly and do it in a really small, impactful way. Um, and and start to kind of slowly convince people of the power of these workshops. And then, as I say, show them the results of that, show the follow-up. You know, that's where people start to really lose faith in workshops being, you know, just a, a jolly, something that we do to have a little bit of fun. But they can really, really change the way that your team, your, your team works together. So showing that in the way that you take the content that was produced in the workshop and feeding it into the project that you're working on and yeah. changing the way that you work together. Thank you. I think there was a lot of value in that in that entire talk based on those, you know, the fact that we have often have to do a lot of facilitation just to start to learn new things and where we work. Thank you very much, Alison. Thanks a lot. Thank you.